We've talked a lot about SHAT, simulation of high altitude training. It will often get called in the research, intermittent, what could the H stand for? Hypoxic. Hypoxic, and the other H stands for? Hypercapnic training, yeah? So, hypoxic, hypercapnic training. I've forgotten. Someone remind me, what does hypoxic mean? Yeah, low oxygen. Are we happy with that? Low oxygen. What does hypercapnic mean? High CO2. High CO2, yeah. The hyper is for the high, the hypo is for the low. We're doing our breath holds after an inhale or an exhale? Exhale. After exhale, why? <coughs> which which are we going to get sooner? Hypoxia. We're going to get our hypoxia quicker, sooner. Yeah? Hypoxia is something less than 91% SpO2, so blood oxygen saturation. Yeah, this is recapping stuff we've already said. Yeah, just solidifying these things. Yeah, but we haven't we haven't spoke too much about this. We've talked a lot about how the central chemoreceptors in the brainstem are sensitive to changes on in in carbon dioxide because of the effect it has on the pH of the blood. Yeah. So when as CO2 increases, what happens to pH? pH is going down. The H stands for hydrogen. Remember that for later, hydrogen ions. Remember that for later. Lower pH means what? More acidic or more alkali? More acidic. Good. Yeah. That's what these most interested in, most responsive to, yeah? We have our peripheral chemoreceptors and they are responsive to these lower changes in oxygen when we become to this sort of more critical state of hypoxia. Does that make sense? Okay, and there's two things that potentially happen in response to the low oxygen. In terms of the high CO2, what's, what are we looking for? What are we looking for with our breath holder? Why are we, why are we trying to create this? Does it feel nice? No. No, again, nice, no, <laughs> not nice. But we're building some tolerance to it, physiologically and Psychologically, yeah? So we are training those, both those two things, okay? So we've talked an awful lot about that. What we're going to look at on this side is like, why would we want to get hypoxic? Why do we want to get intermittently <coughs> hypoxic? Yeah, we hold the breath. After the exhale, we get hypoxic, hypercapnic. We recover our breathing. We then do another one. We're typically doing like five in the, in the exercise that we're doing. So it's intermittent, yeah? We're getting bouts of it, that makes sense? Yeah? Um, and it's simulating what high altitude training is like. When we get to something like, say, 85%-ish, it's like about 4,000 to 5,000 meters of altitude, something like that, mid to low 80s. That's the sort of equivalent. That's why it gets that name of simulation of altitude training, yeah? When we have oxygen going down lower than 91%, when we're getting to a state of hypoxia, two things can happen. One, short term. The second, long term. Yeah? In the short term, our spleen, and in the long term, we're talking about kidneys and EPO. So let's do short term first. Yeah? In the short term, 
in response, do you think when your body notices oxygen gets down low, do you think it's happy? No. no. When George was talking about sleep apnea and saying there's this gasping reflex when oxygen's dropped really low, that's, the, that's not the central chemoreceptors, that's, that's the peripheral chemoreceptors going, whoa, 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 oxygen is like, remember, outside of normal, we've got this 91 to 95 that's outside of normal, but it's not like scary yet. When we start to go below 91, brain's not happy. We need to get some more oxygen in here, boys and girls. <coughs> that's what it's saying. This is the, the conversation between my receptors and me. Yeah, so when I'm doing my breath holding, it starts to go down low. My body starts going, need a bit of help on the old oxygen level, Jacko. What can we do? And the spleen goes, don't worry, pal. I can help because I hold about 8% additional red blood cells just in case of emergencies. Because remember, oxygen is so important to life. And so what it does is it contracts and... I think for some reason I'm wanting to say like an ejaculation, but it's not. But it's <laughs> similar type of thing, lab wise. Yeah, it is releasing um, some additional red blood cells, and it goes, "There you go. How's that feel?" And the body goes, "Oh, I've got some more red blood cells, so I've got a greater oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Feels a bit better." Yeah, and then after a while, research is varied on this. Somewhere between 10 minutes to one hour before the body will reabsorb them. Does that make sense? So if I'd, and the strongest contraction of the spleen after five breath holds. How many breath holds have we been doing, saying that we say to do in the manual? Five. There's a reason. <laughs> everything, there's a reason behind everything that we do. If we ask you to do anything, you should be able to say, why is that? And it shouldn't be mm, just because. There should be a reason. We're doing, this is why we're doing. Yeah? Happy? Yeah? Uh, five, so when we do five, str the strongest contraction of the spleen after five breath holes. I feel like it's 20% contraction of the spleen, something like that. Anyway, the... Um, yeah. So warm up. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> warm up. I do some breath holds. One, it clears my nose. Two, it's upregulating for the nervous system. Tick, tick. Three, maybe I throw a bit more juice out there. I get a bit by my spleen contracts and I get a few more red blood cells circulating around. Is that going to be good for my session that might last an hour? or the first half of a football or rugby match, and then I do a couple at half-time as well. That makes sense? If I'm going to do them in the warm-up before competition, what's going up? So I do five, and I get some five decent breath holes in. What's high at the end of that? CO2. If I've generated a load of CO2, do I want to then step onto the competition arena with, like, my CO2 levels jacked up? No. So you'll read in the manual um, describes doing what basically is like a just get rid, like take a few deeper breaths to get rid of the CO2 that you've built up before you go into your like full blown competition. But in training, you wouldn't want to do that because you'd be just get. We want to keep that CO2 in to build up the tolerance of that stimulus. Does that make sense? That's just one. That's just one difference between. I'm going into competition compared to I'm training. The same way I get strong in the gym doing squats for my legs and I don't take that weight with me onto the rugby field. Yeah. It sounds, it's, 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 it's Sorry, so we makes do, it obvious. You do the exercises, but you let the exhale. On the, last, on the last repetition, you might choose to get rid of some of the CO2 just so that you, you're going in with normal levels of CO2 into your competition rather than elevated levels of CO2. And Good question. If my marathon, if my, uh, depending on the person, if you're going to do a marathon, would you still want the first hour to feel a bit easier? 
So I would. It doesn't mean you have a big drop off after an hour. You just go back to normal. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to be worse. So it's like, may as well make the first hour of it. But it's a good question in terms of going like, it's not lasting forever. And they're being reabsorbed. Yes, exactly. Yeah? The what, sorry? Oh, short term. Yeah, so short term, so... Meaning it only lasts for something like 10 minutes up to an hour. A release of additional red blood cells. Yeah? Okay. Is that right? The spleen is like a blood bank, like a backup system of blood. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah? Happy? Long term, there is... Um, a spike in EPO that the kidneys make, natural hormone that the body makes. Naughty people in sports take it in small amounts so that no one finds out. I'm not here to talk about, I'd love to talk about, I could do a big presentation about doping, but it's not my specialty, just a personal interest. As in, not that I take stuff, but as in, I find it fascinating what the naughty people do um, and how the general public, we don't think that they do. Anyway, EPO, like anything people take, like the body makes it naturally. So you make EPO naturally. It stimulates your bone marrow to make, to maturate red blood cells. You're generate, this is a process that's happening all the time. Red blood cells are dying and new ones are being made. It's something like, is it like a seven week cycle or something like that? It happens over a, over a series of weeks. It's something that's always happening. Yeah? When I, and again, it's about red blood cells. So it's about oxygen. And it's, this is where low oxygen is going to stimulate a release of EPO. Strongest, have a guess, after how many breath holds? Five. Strongest after five breath holds. And um, I think the, the peak in EPO during one of some of the studies has been a 24% increase in EPO, naturally. Um, and it peaks something like three hours after the last breath hold. Okay? That hasn't done anything to your blood levels, but after... It's long term, after about three to four days, you maturate, your bone marrow creates some additional red blood cells. That's what the hormone is doing. It's a process that naturally happens within the body, but you are stimulating this through breath holding. Does that make sense? So if I've got a competition three or four days out from it, if I'm doing some breath holding, I might influence that. But one, one day, one, doing five breath holds once, four days before my marathon, is gonna have a very small effect. But if for the previous year, I've been regularly doing breath holding, I've been regularly simulating high altitude training, I'm going to have a more of a, a, a knock-on compounding effect. When we go and do altitude training, when we go to altitude, there is an adaptation phase. When I come back from altitude, there's a, a, a series of, of um, re-adaptation or coming back to baseline. Whereas I can simulate altitude training, we did it in here. I can do it in my kitchen at home. I can do it wherever. I don't have to actually go, so I don't have to spend the money to go to altitude. The logistics of doing breath holding is very simple. Exhale, hold your breath. We've got an increase in potentially the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood from those two mechanisms, yeah? We've got an increase in CO2 tolerance, yeah? Because we're getting exposure to that, yeah? And when we, um, when we combine breath holding, which I'll go into more tomorrow morning, when we combine breath holding with, so that's more, you know, if we're talking about aerobic capacity, yeah, and endurance athletes, when we combine breath holding with anaerobic work, we're gonna see tomorrow, 
I'm just teeing you up for it. We're going to see tomorrow that you'll have the opportunity to increase the anaerobic sort of stimulus to get a stronger response from that. Because if aerobic is with oxygen, what's anaerobic mean? Yeah. So when there is insufficient oxygen um, <coughs> available for the intensity that, like, because of the intensity and speed that you're working at and the and short recovery times that you've got. Yeah. Because there is a job that the oxygen does to oxidize. Remember our hydrogen ions? When there's a lot of oxygen, when there's a sufficient oxygen available, it can, we call it oxidizing to make. If this, is, if this creates acidic environment, what's water? Neutral. Is water, is water uncomfortable? No. Happy days. If I'm holding my breath and doing something anaerobic, like repeated sprints, we don't have that available. So what happens to him? He's got to, he's, he's got to be processed. And that's where, when we, are, we haven't got sufficient oxygen available, this goes through the lactate pathway that ends up giving us a, so lactic, creates lactic acid, which dissociates into a lactate ion, and unfortunately, another H plus ion. <laughs> but essentially, we can create a more, even stronger acidic environment for our muscles to work, that we then get exposure to, and how does the body adapt? It gets better at buffering, the acidity and that the main sort of overriding um, point in terms of delaying the onset of muscle fatigue, improving lactate tolerance, improving um, lactate clearance and improving recovery between like high intensity work is that with breath holding as part of high intensity and repeat bouts of work, we're disrupting the acid base and base is just another word for like alkaline, really. We're disrupting the acid base balance by basically creating more of this present in the tissues. So the more sport specific it is, those tissues are getting more of that. And you're basically going, deal with that. And the body having exposure to it improves its ability to buffer the acidic environment that we're creating okay we'll look tomorrow morning when the brain is nice and fresh at just probably the last like bit of harder chemistry to just go why is that the case but that's the overriding thing that's going on so it's just to go breath holding helpful for both aerobic and anaerobic depending on how we apply it yeah we've talked so far until just now all about like um, bolt score, building CO2 tolerance and all that. Now we've understood hopefully why the um, reducing oxygen, why creating hypoxia creates a stimulus that we adapt to and why we would want to do that with athletes. Yeah, so the, the SHAT, the intermittent hypoxic, hypercapnic training, it's very much about sports performance. Yeah.